توکلوا علیہ ونعوذ باللہ من شرور انفسنا ومن سیئیات اعمالنا من يهده اللہ فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادی له ونشهد ان لا الہ الا اللہ وحده لا شریک له وشهد ان محمد عبده ورسوله قال اللہ تعالی في القرآن المجید بعد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم وقضا ربك ان لا تعبدوا الا اياه وبالوالدين احسانا اما يبلغن عندك الكبر احدهما او كلاهما او كلاهما فلا تقل لهما اف ولا تنهرهما وقل لهما قولا كريما اما بعد my dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله i wanted to use this juma to remind ourselves of something that we're all aware of and that is how to interact with other human beings as muslims and I wanted to bring up one hadith It's a very beautiful hadith that relates a story of three men It's a lengthy hadith So I'll stick to the English loose translation And the story goes There was three men and they were actually Christian men This is before the time of Muhammad wasallam, And these Christian men were Christians as in believers Monotheistic Christians who worshipped Allah They were righteous men and so they were traveling in the desert and the hadith states that they came upon a storm, a sandstorm, and they took refuge in a cave. And when they took refuge in this cave, while the storm was going on, a giant boulder or a stone blocked the entrance and exit of the cave. In other words, they were locked in and they tried to push and do whatever they could to get out, but they couldn't. So after exhausting all possibilities, they started to understand to call upon the Creator. They were in a situation where they had no other choice and they realized that let's make dua to Allah and hopefully He'll get us out of this. And what they did was they went in search of themselves in their hearts and they asked Allah, obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need anything, but they asked Allah calling upon one of their good deeds. They looked back at their life and they thought of something that they thought they did with pure sincerity for the sake of Allah. And they each asked Allah, Ya Allah, I did this deed, remember this deed in my life and I did it really just to please you. So Ya Allah, please if you accept it, let us out of this situation, right? And so what's interesting about this is the Quran also mentions, it's a little tangent, the Quran also mentions that when people go on ships in the ocean and they get in similar situations where a storm comes or their lives are in danger they instantly worship and call upon Allah Ya Allah save me I'll do anything you know they start making promises because they realize their lives are in danger there's no 911 or anything to save them and the Quran talks about this and then when they reach ashore safely they forget the promises they made it's interesting the word for human the word for human and forget in Arabi have the same roots, right? In the Arabic language, the linguistic rule is that if a word has the same roots, they're related somehow, right? Like ilm, knowledge, and mul, teacher, right? They're related. They have the same mim, ayn, and lam. So similarly, uh, we have this concept in Arabi, right? So anyways, nunsa and insan come from the same root. Forget and mankind come from the same root. So mankind is very forgetful. So going back to the story, the first man, he made dua. He was a shepherd. And what he used to do was he used to take his flock around and, you know, tend to his sheep throughout the day and come back at night and take care of his family. And he had old parents that he took care of. He was very respectful and very caretaking of them. And so one day, it just so happened to graze. He went a little too far for the sheep. Uh, for them to graze and by the time he got back it was very late and his parents were asleep now he knew that the only food his family and his parents had was the food with him i.e. the goats and sheep's milk that he would have given them so he understood that his parents went to sleep hungry and his children were awake and they were crying and they were hungry so they were pulling on his clothes to ask for food so he thought about it and he it didn't settle well with him that he give food to his children and they sleep with full bellies where his parents went to sleep with empty bellies and hungry so what he did was he took the milk that he was going to give to his parents but he was late unfortunately and he waited all night for his parents to wake up he didn't bother them and disturb them and when they woke up he instantly you know apologized and he gave them the milk 
So in this cave, he made dua to Allah, Ya Allah, if I did this with ikhlas, if I did this sincerely for your pleasure, Ya Allah, please accept this. And so the rock moved a little bit. It moved one third of the way. So the second man, he was a man who had a crush or loved, if you will, his cousin, his Ammu's daughter. Now, one more tangent really quick. Living in America, we have this big concept that's from the Western society that loving or marrying your cousin is something really bad it's like your sister etc etc and oftentimes we as muslims we don't know any better and we you know we start believing what we hear because that's where we live right but the danger of this and i want to show you the danger of this mentality is that if you believe if you just believe that marrying your cousin is something bad or something looked down upon remember rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam married his cousin i'm not saying it's a sunnah and you have to do it but he did do it so if you believe that it's wrong, if you believe that it's bad, indirectly you're saying Rasulullah the purest of all mankind did something bad or did something shameful. So you might want to reassess your values and morals, not based on Western society, but based on your deen, in which it is perfectly lawful to marry your cousins, not something to be ashamed of. Right? So going back to the story, this man loved his cousin, he desired her very much. And the hadith states that her family fell upon harsh times and they were in a state of extreme poverty. And what's interesting is the hadith states, kufra, that poverty is such a thing that it begets or it leads to kufr. I'm not justifying sin in any which way, shape or form, but just so that we have a little bit of understanding when we see somebody who may be stealing a loaf of bread or whatever it may be, instead of instantly looking down upon them and cursing them and condemning them, we should think what kind of a situation led that person to do such a thing, right? And Rasul is telling us that poverty is such a thing that it leads to kufr. It's not something small, it's not something to be taken lightly. So anyways, so she fell upon poverty and so she asked her cousin this man who was well off he she asked him for some money it's a very humiliating humiliating situation to be in but nevertheless she had to do it so he saw this opportunity right because he obviously he wanted her a lot so he said okay i'll give you the money but you have to come with me in other words you know you have to cohabitate with me obviously she didn't like it but under the circumstance she said okay so she took the money you know, she fed her family, whatever. And so what happened was when the time came for them to go and cohabitate, they were together. And before doing it, she looked at him and she just said a few words. She looked at him and she said, Ittaqullah. She said, fear Allah. Have the taqwa of Allah. She reminded him of this, right? Mankind is quick to forget. So in that instant, in that instant, the man realized the, the fault that he did, the, he realized the stupidity that he was doing and he instantly left, he instantly just left and in this cave he made dua that Ya Allah, if I left out of your fear if I left solely out of, for, to please you because I was afraid of you and I, was, I had ikhlas, I was sincere in my motives of leaving I didn't want anything else except your fear and your pleasure Ya Allah, please accept it, right? and so the stone moved another third of the way and so the last person was a employer, a type of businessman. He basically, he had employees working for him. And what he did one day was, his workers used to work and he used to give them their wages. But one time, somebody was working for him and he left without being able to collect his wages for that day. So what he did was he took that money that was supposed to be for that man, whatever it may have been, 5, 10, 20, 30, doesn't matter. He took that money and with the intention that it's this person's money, it's not my money, he invested it for that person. He invested in that person and subhanAllah, by the time the man returned, it had been a few months or whatever, that money and wealth had multiplied many fold, many, many, many fold. It was now a bunch of camels and cows and it multiplied. It was a huge amount of wealth now. So when this man came back and he said, you know, such and such, I worked on such and such day and, you know, I never got paid. Can you pay me? The man, instead of giving him the wages that he just owed him, whatever that little amount of money was, he told him that, look, when you left, I took your money and I invested it for you. And the investment that is your return is what you see is all these animals and all this wealth 
So the man looked at him, he said, you know, don't mock me, don't joke with me, don't insult me, I just want my wages, please. And the man told him, he said, I'm not joking, I'm not mocking you, I'm sincere, this is all yours, this is all yours. So in the cave, he said, Ya Allah, if I gave that wealth and I was truthful and honest in my dealings, just for your pleasure, just for your sake, with no other motives, I didn't want anything else except your pleasure, ikhlas is that key point of sincerity. I said, Ya Allah, if I did that, please accept it. So then the stone moved that last third, that last third part of the way and the men were free. And that's the general gist of the hadith. Now going back just to analyze each man, and what they have in common. The first man and the Qur'an ayah that I recited in the beginning was respectful to his parents. And it was such a great deed, it was such a big thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted it, right? And that Qur'an ayah I told you about in the beginning I, I recited, the loose translation is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُ إِلَّا إِيَّا That I command you, Allah commands you only to worship nothing else except Allah Right? And right after he says that, the capital idea of Islam is Tawheed, the worship of one God. That's the fundamental idea. And right after saying such a big thing, the basis of Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you to respect your parents, right? Ihsan, to do Ihsan. Ihsan is not just kindness, but if you will, the next level of kindness. There's no real English translation. Arabi is a very deep language. And most of the indo pacs will also understand the word Ihsan because we use it as well. But do Ihsan on your parents, right? And after that it says, That if you find one of them or both of them in old age, right? In other words, if you're lucky enough to have one or both of your parents in old age, and I use the word lucky very, very key here. If you're lucky enough to have one of both of your parents in old age, the Quran uses this word, uf. It's very interesting. I didn't know that before I learned that. Quran uses the word uf. Don't even say uf to them. Uf is like used here as such a small expression of, you know, I don't want to do it, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, of disple displeasure, right? Don't even say uf to them, much less whatever else we have said or we say to our parents, may Allah forgive us and give us tawfiq to not do so, right? Don't even say uf to them. Rather, وَقُلْ لَهُمَا قَوْلًا كَرِيمًا Rather, speak to them in such a manner that's kareem. Again, kareem doesn't really have a English translation, but words of kindness, of coolness, of, of, of gentleness, right? And I didn't recite the next ayah, but the next ayah is very beautiful. وَاخْفِدْ لَهُمَا جَنَاحَ الظُّلِّ مِنَ الرَّحْمَةِ وَقُلْ رَبِّ رْحَمْهُمَا كَمَا رَبَّ يَعْنِ صَغِيرًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, lower, وَاخْفِدْ لَهُمَا جَنَاحَ الظُّلِّ Lower the wing, if you will, lower your wing of tenderness, of softness, of kindness to them. وَاخْفِدْ لَهُمَا جَنَاحَ الظُّلِّ مِنَ الرَّحْمَةِ Like from your mercy and tenderness. وَقُلْ رَبِّرْحُمْ And say and make dua وَقُلْ رَبِّرْحَمْهُمَا كَمَا رَبَّ يَعْنِ صَغِيرًا Very famous dua I'm sure most of us know for those of us who don't know and want to learn it's Surah Isra Ayah 24 Right? رَبِّرْحَمْهُمَا كَمَا رَبَّ يَعْنِ صَغِيرًا Ya Allah have mercy on my parents just like they had mercy on me when I was young and what's interesting as I get older and my brother has kids and etc etc I see the cycle of life, you're a kid, then you become a parent, and then you go on to return to Allah, the usual normal cycle. And what's interesting is when we're kids, you know, by the time we become adults, we forget. We don't remember what it is to be a kid because it's been so long, right? Insan and nunsa, humanity, forgetfulness, right? We forget the way we kept our parents up all night <clears throat> or bothered them or, you know, whatever it may have been. They had to change our diapers. We were helpless. But we forget that at one point in time we were helpless because now we're young and we're able and, you know, we have all this power and strength. So we forget. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us in this dua that have mercy on them because they're old and helpless, in other words, just like they had mercy on me when I was helpless. In other words, we can't see ourselves in either of those shoes because we're not children and we're not old like our parents. We're right in between. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us of both. You're, you were here and you're either going to die or you're going to end up old and helpless. So don't forget, right? Have mercy on your parents then that's the story of the first person and basically it's, it's such a magnanimous act to respect and give izzah to your parents. 
The second person, very interesting story, was obviously, you know, very simply, he stayed away from zina, he stayed away from, you know, fornicating, and, right, that was the goodness. That's the lesson to be taken away. But more interestingly is the fact that he told the woman in the first place that, look, you know, I'll give you money if you sleep with me. That in and of itself is wrong, right? Then on top of that, he made preparations or whatever to meet her wherever they may have been to do the deed, right? That's another wrong. So there's wrong all the way across. There's nothing halal going on here. There's nothing good going on here. But subhanAllah, the very last second, the very last second before he was just about to do it, she reminded him, a reminder, right? Right, this is what the Quran tells us, remind, remind, because it's tanfa'ul mu'mineen, it's beneficial for the believers. It's interesting that the Quran says believers and not just anybody, because belief is a prerequisite for it to be beneficial. But she reminded him, right? And so at the last second, he walked away. So he did wrong, he did wrong, he did wrong, he did wrong, but at the last second, he did right. And when he made dua in the cave, He's not reminding Allah, Ya Allah, I sinned, you know, please let me out of this cave. He's saying, Allah, please accept this good deed. And Allah accepted it. So the lesson is that we have sinned so much in our lives and we continue to sin. Myself, our, all of us, you know, it's no secret, right? We all sin. But sometimes we get caught in this wrong, extremely wrong stigma that, you know, I, did, I do this every day. It's no big deal. I know it's wrong, but you know, I don't, I'm not even going to bother trying to stop. Or I do this haram, I might as well do that haram, right? This is shaitan, right? Playing on our psyche, right? And subhanAllah, what happens is when you stop a haram, even though you've prepared and done so much work for it, but you stop, instead of writing a bad deed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changes it to a good deed. In other words, you didn't intend to do anything good, you intended to do something bad. But now, because you stopped, that became a good deed. In fact, a great deed, right? Enough that this person, of all the things he could have called on, right? Of all the things he could have remembered in his life, whatever he may have done, he called on that deed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted it, right? And so, lastly, the third person, very basically, obviously, he was honest in his business dealings, right? And unfortunately, we take this very lightly, but it's something that's such a big deal. It's such a, it's such a huge act that when a human being, Muslim or non-Muslim, they see that in you, they automatically understand that this person has something that I want. He has a truth in him. He has something right in him, right? And subhanAllah, you have this a spectrum of business, right? On the left end, you have cheating, right? You have waylul mutaffifin, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a whole surah uh, warning or, you know, damning, if you will, the cheaters of, in their business transactions. Then you have the middle path, just, you know, a straight-edged guy, you know, you give what you get, very strict and very, you know, by the book. And that's great. But you have the other end of that spectrum, which is the right end of that spectrum. And that spectrum is to give extra. In other words, if this person, you know, had five pounds or whatever, you give him a little extra, right? And traditionally, Muslims were those people known to be of the right hand, right? Of the right end of that spectrum. In other words, if you were buying five pounds, they would give you maybe five and a half pounds or six pounds of whatever it may be, you know, just for example. And it's not because of interest or, you know, they want to be your friend or whatever, right? Traditionally, it's because Muslims have this understanding that we have an account here of our business transactions, right? But we have a bigger account of our deeds, of our lives, right? And that day when those transactions are pulled up, all of our lives is pulled up, I want to make sure that I didn't do anything wrong. And if I did accidentally, unintentionally, you know, give somebody less than they deserved, I want to compensate for that by giving them some more that they may not have written down or they may not be paying for just in case, right? just in case because they're not thinking about this dunya they're not thinking about you know five ten dollars they're thinking about what happens when I die right it's a completely different understanding it's a completely different perspective on life and this is really what Islam does to you uh, you know inshallah give us the tawfiq to understand that right is this man could have easily just given him his wages and called it a day and the hadith says that when the person came back for his wages and he saw all this wealth he said don't mock me and he was he was told that all of it is his you know instead of leaving some behind just because the guy was nice enough to tell he took everything he took all of it every last cow every last camel right the hadith tells us that he took everything right and subhanallah right this man just lost a ton of money 
you know? In these days, in today's day and age, if you hear somebody do something like this, you know, we look at them like, oh, you're a foolish man, you're a bad businessman, you're dumb, you know? You're backwards, you're a simpleton. This, this, is, this is the stigma, this is the common perception that Muslims have, and I, I've heard it with my own two ears. I'm not just speaking on other people's behalf. It's, it's, a, it's a stereotype that generation after generation has been, you know, uh, perpetuating. And really, it's up to each and every one of us to stop this. We all know the cases of back home, whether it's the Middle East, Pakistan, Egypt, whatever it may be, the mentality of a lot of people there is cheat or be cheated, right? Kill or be killed. And really, that's what it is, you know? A cop pulls somebody over, you give them some money and call it a day. Like really, it's just, you, it's almost to the point where you can't avoid it. So unfortunately, it begets this mentality where you're constantly on guard that somebody's going to cheat you and somebody's going to rip you off. And so what do you do? You do that to that person. You, you project that onto other people, right? And it's come here and we have that in, in, in Muslim stores, right? It's, it's, it's unfortunate, but really it's up to each and every one of us right now, right here, old, young, you know, American born or not born, it doesn't matter, to stop that and understand what Islam says about business dealings and honesty and to perpetuate that, inshallah. And so really the takeaway from all three of these stories, the key point that I really wanted to drive home here was the reminder that the one thing that all three of these people had in common when they called upon Allah for a good deed throughout their lives, they didn't say, Ya Allah, I did Hajj, or Ya Allah, I fasted, you know, Ya Allah, I stayed up all night worshipping you, even though all these are great things, absolutely great things, I'm not diminishing them. But when they really, really were in a tight situation, in other words, it was life or death, and they looked at themselves, and they wanted to think of one situation where they're like, this is it, right? This is, if my life is on the line, I want to give my best, whatever I can possibly do, they called on situations that had to do with other people. حقوق ibad, right? The rights of other people. The rights of parents, the rights of society, men and women, and the rights of business transaction, the rights of people in, in your business dealings, in your honesty, in your sincerity. And so all these three people, they called upon a deed that they did interactions with other humans, but they did so with intentions of ikhlas. They did so not to make people think that they're great and they're honest and they're nice people, they're God-fearing people. No, 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 no. They did it with ikhlas. They did it only and only to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And really, the question we should all ask ourselves at this point, including me, is that what if we were in a situation where we're on a ship or we're on a plane and it's going down or we're in a cave and there's no way out, right? Or we're in a sinkhole. And it happens, right? It happens these days. It's not something unheard of. What happened, right? And we have to ask Allah that, Ya Allah, save us from this, you know? And we want to use something that, Ya Allah, remember I did this deed. Do we have a deed, right? We should ask ourselves, do we have a deed that we can say, Ya Allah, remember the time I did this. Ya Allah, please accept it. I did it only for you, right? There's a famous hadith that it tells us, uh, to hasten in performing your good deeds. Like, don't waste. Don't waste an opportunity. Do, be constantly aware of trying to do good, right? And the hadith continues to say that, are you waiting for such poverty that you lead to kufr, right? That you become ungrateful. Or are you waiting for such affluence that you become arrogant? You know, you become so wealthy you forget Allah, right? Or are you waiting for old age that you're decrepit and you can't do anything? Or are you waiting for such a sickness that now you're bedridden and you can't do anything, right? And are you waiting for death, an unexpected death, a heart attack or a car accident, right? Happens all the time, we all know, right? Or what are you waiting for? And Rasulullah is naming all these things that we all take for granted, our time, our health, right? Our wealth. We take these things for granted and we forget, right? Until they're taken away, until it's too late. And then he finishes, are you waiting for the Dajjal? He's a very evil fitna. Or are you waiting for the hour, right? Its calamity is very great. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq to remember this story throughout our lives and try to instill it in our hearts, the principles derived from it with ikhlas and treat each other with these kinds of characteristics that Muslims are supposed to have for the sole sake of the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Allahumma ameen.
الحمد لله علي علي الذات عظيم الصفات السميع السماد كبير الشان جليل القدر رفيع الذكر مطاع الأمر جليل البرهان فخيم الاسم غزير العلم وسيل الحلم كثير الغفران سميع الثناء جزيل العطاء مجيب الدعاء عميل الإحسان سريع الحساب شديد العقاب أليم العذاب عزيز السلطان ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له في الخلق والأمر ونشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله المبعوث إلى الأسود والأحمر المنعوت بالشرح الصدر ورفع الذكر وصلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحاب الذين هم خلاصة العرب العرباء وخير الخلائق بعد الأنبياء أما بعد فيا أيها الناس وحد الله فإن التوحيد رأس الطاعة واتقوا الله فإن التقوى ملاك الحسنات وعليكم بالسنة فإن السنة تهدي إلى العطاعة ومن أطاع الله ورسوله فقد رشد واهتدى أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وقال ربكم ادعوني أستجب لكم إن الذين يستكبرون عن عبادتي سيدخلون جهنم داخرين بارك الله لنا ولكم في القرآن العظيم ونفعنا وإياكم بالآيات والذكر الحكيم أستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم الحمد لله يستعينه واستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي السعة من يطيع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعص الله ورسوله فإنه لا يضر إلا نفسه ولا يضر الله شيئا أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وسلم تسليما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أرحم أمتي بأمتي أبو بكر وأشدهم في أمر الله عمر وأستقم حيان عثمان وأقضاهم علي وفاطمة سيدة نساء أهل الجنة والحسن حسين شباب أهل الجنة وحمزة أسد الله وأسد رسوله الله الله في أصحابي إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروني أذكركم واشكروا لي ولا تكفرون أقيموا الصلاة السلام عليكم um, We have many announcements today but I'll try to make it very brief uh, in the interest of time uh, you know, apart from giving you the regular prayer timings and other things, uh, the purpose of the announcements is to, you know, make um, aware of uh, 